Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Kemney Parish Church. To all who are here in person, all who are watching online on our catch up service, welcome to worship, everyone. And an apology must be offered for last week and for the difficulty in the decision of canceling worship last week. It was not an easy decision to make in light of the increased numbers of cases running around Kemney. But we are back and we are open once again for worship. And so I encourage you, if at all able, to come and join us in person as we continue to worship the Lord here each Sunday in Kemne Parish Church. I think an intimation about our Good Morning group. It's continuing in person monthly, and I believe it's now moved to this Tuesday, 14th of March, at the Church Center at 10 o'clock in the morning. And the, to the topic of this time will be, come with us to Brunei. And this is with Alan and Linda Gorvet. And so Alan and Linda are paying for all of us to go to Brunei with them. It's very generous, I think. But we're looking, I'm sure this will be a, a wonderful presentation from Alan and Linda for all who choose to join the Good Morning Group this coming Tuesday for a time of fellowship, again, 10 o'clock in the morning at the church center. Are there any other intimations to share at the start of our time together? Yes, Andrew. Yes, so the end of this month, the final Sunday of March, March the 26th, I believe, will be after we have worship here in the church, there'll be an opportunity for a Q&A session with myself and with other members of the steering group that's been tasked with facilitating the possibility of a union between our church and Kintor and Ekt, Midmar, Blair Daff, Chapel of Geary, and Clooney and Money Musk. By now, we hope we've all received a copy of the Kirk News, and you'll notice it was a bit thicker than usual this time. There is extra literature that would needed to be absorbed and carefully read, detailing what would a union between our churches look like, how would it work, what are the steps necessary. And this Q&A session for us <clears throat> is in preparation of a congregational vote that will take place uh, after worship on the 7th of March, 2000, May, sorry, May, quite right, thank you, sorry, 7th of May, 7th of May, I haven't tried to pull the fast one because we've already passed the 7th of March, aren't we? 7th of May, thank you, Noel, and everybody else who chimed in. So you've been reading the literature as well, this is a very encouraging sign. So the 7th of May, 2023, after worship, we'll have a congregational vote here in the church to determine a yay or a nay to a basis of union with the other churches, as well as a basis of team ministry between the ministers involved. So this is a very, very important time in the life of our church. So please read through the information provided um, more than once if you can, prayerfully consider it, and any questions that are percolating that come up for you, please bring those with you to uh, after worship on March the 26th, and we'll discuss them as thoroughly and clearly as we possibly can. Are there any other intimations to share at the start of our time together? Okay. Let's take a moment to quiet our minds and our hearts for worship. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, and let us worship God with singing our first song, Hear the Call of the Kingdom.
Let us come together in prayer. Let us pray. It's a cold, murky day, but we define March as the beginning of spring. However, you, Lord, have reminded us differently. We do recognize that the days are getting longer, mornings are brighter, especially this week, as when we awoke on Tuesday, everything outside was sparkly. Snow had appeared once more. It gave us time to observe your world, Lord, from indoors. As the silent snowflakes fell, we saw the trees and hedges capturing each unique hexagonal white flake. And by Friday, as the feeble sun melted the edges of the snow clusters, the birds began to venture out of their hidden nests in the hedgerows, and the colourful crocuses, having hunkered down under the snowy carpet on Tuesday, bravely pushed their heads through towards the light. Taking time to observe, we marvel at your wonderful evolving creations. Thank you so much, Lord. At this time, when so many are contra contracted COVID, friendships are extremely important. Please guide us, Lord, to be aware of others and make ourselves available to help with physical tasks, as well as being a friendly face in people's enforced isolation. Help us to show them how special your friendship is to each of us. You're our best friend because you listen, you do not condemn. You never leave us when times are bad. And most importantly, you encourage us to take time to converse with you. We know that you walk beside us always, placing a hand on our shoulder or carrying us when you deem the need is required. You are a true and special friend. Thank you, Lord. As we look around, help us to be more observant and take note of how we may be causing problems to our climate and guide us to make a more collaborative effort to curtail the damage we are causing. Help us to refrain from hurting others through our use of rash words or thoughtless actions. May we all be more like Jesus, being kind, developing friendships, and treating everyone with respect, no matter how different they seem to us. As every person, like each snowflake, is unique and special in your eyes, Lord. We are thankful that we can call you our best friend. The other day I read a beautiful poem about Christopher Robin's friendship with his bear Pooh. To me, it sums up friendship with you, Lord. Wherever I am, there's always you. There's always you and me. Whatever I do, you do too. Wherever I go, you go too. What would I do without you? Being one makes me feel rather blue, but two can stick together, just like glue. That's how should it should always be for us too. Dear Father Lord, help us to take a minute or two each day to stop in our busy lives. Listen to the sounds of the world around us and converse with you, Lord, our best friend. Amen. Thank you, Anne. I hear some children's voices with us up in the balcony today, and it's always nice to hear happy and young voices with us, <clears throat> including the voice of my own son. Can you see over the balcony? Nope. Thick. 
Hi there. <laughs> so in just a few moments, our children can be excused to go on to fantastic families over at the church center. But first, we're going to sing a very special kids song. It's called I Am the Church. And this actually relates today to what we're going to be learning here in the church as adults as well, but what it means to be the church. We'll sing this together as food for thought and to help join with our kids in worship as well. So let's sing together now. Right, so today's reading is in Ephesians chapter 1, uh, sorry, Ephesians 1, uh, chapter 3. Paul the preacher to the Gentiles. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. That is the mystery known to me by revelation. As I have already written briefly, in this reading then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to men in other generations as as it has been revealed, uh, as it has been revealed by the Spirit uh, to God's holy apostles and prophets. This mystery is that through the gospel of the Gentiles, their heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and shares together in the promise of Jesus Christ. 
I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given to me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all of God's people, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to make plain to everyone the administration of this mystery, if, which for ages past was kept hidden in God who created all things. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities of the heavenly realms, according to this eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. I ask you, therefore, not to be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are your glory. Amen. We continue to <clears throat> worship God now and sing together blessing and honor and glory and power. Let us pray. Lord, as we pause to consider your word, as we wrestle with the meaning of Ephesians 3, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our minds and our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Loving God, you are the strength and the redemption of all who place hope and trust in you. Amen. So this week, I hope you don't mind if I sit today, we're continuing with our series on Ephesians. And this series will run for the rest of this month 
up, and up until Holy Week at the start of April. And I've said before here in church, and I'll say it again, that when the Bible repeats itself, we need to pay attention. Let me say that again. I guess to a lesser extent it might apply to preaching as well. Today's passage from Ephesians 3 has some measure of repetition, but I think it's quite subtle. In fact, it's a repetition of one word. Did anyone catch the one word that was repeated over and over again in chapter 3 today? Say again. Louder, Anne. Yes, indeed, the word is mystery. It was in verses 3, 4, 6, and verse 9, right? Four times in a few short verses. And what do we think of when we hear the word mystery? What comes to mind? Yeah. Something you can't explain. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I think there was maybe a TV show called Unsolved Mysteries at one point or th something like that. But it's a mystery. We think of it as like a puzzle, maybe something that we, as naturally curious human beings, we try to solve. But this is not how the Bible uses the word mystery. It's not. It's never re in the Bible, mystery never refers to something that we under our own intellectual power can, can solve or figure out. Instead, when the Bible speaks of mystery, it's referring to something that is beyond our natural knowledge, beyond our five senses. It's referring to something which can only be grasped, only be grasped, if God shows it to us. Do you hear the difference there? That it's in the Bible, a mystery is something that can be grasped only if God shows it to us. And in Ephesians, Paul is consumed with this mystery. He is utterly bedazzled by what God has revealed to us in Jesus Christ. We think back in the biblical narrative, back to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 9 specifically. And what happens in Acts chapter 9 is the conversion of Saul, the Pharisee, into Paul, the apostle. He's walking along, traveling on the Damascus Road with letters of arrest for early believers. He is breathing out murderous threats against the church. That's what the text tells us. Then all of a sudden, he is absolutely dazzled by this sudden appearance on the road of the risen Son of God, Jesus. And he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, who are you, Lord? And he goes, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. So in that moment, on Acts chapter 9... God revealed something to Saul. He revealed the mystery of salvation. Something that Saul would never would have got to under his own power, right? He needed God to show it to him. Okay? And so ever since that point, Paul the Apostle, as he's now known, is consumed with this mystery. He's utterly bedazzled by what God has revealed in Jesus Christ. And in verses 2 through 6 of our reading today, Paul recaptures what he spelled out for us in chapter 2 of Ephesians. We think back to then, namely that Gentiles, and raise your hand if you're a Gentile. It's not an insult. <laughs> right? Raise your hand if you're a Gentile. Every hand should be up. Come on. Okay? I think every hand should be up at least. But there's Gentiles, and then there's Jews. And, the, and in verses 2 through 6, Paul's reminding the believers that Gentiles and Jews are co-heirs of what God has done in Jesus Christ. And at the time, the church was still very new. It was still finding its way. And when is it not, right? And the church had to come to terms with the fact that in his infinite wisdom, God had brought Gentiles and Jews together. And so in this passage from Ephesians today, Paul's reminding his listeners about a new and radical form of togetherness. He's reminding them that God is very much in the business of breaking down any false, any human-made divisions that we try to build up. And in his death and resurrection, Jesus is the unity of all believers. He's the one who holds the church together. It's not brick. It's not mortar. It's not financial accounts. It's 
not anything else, but it's God in Jesus holding the church together. And he's the one who drives us into new forms of worship, new ways of being the body of Christ. And so we can look around today and think about the work we're doing here to bring our churches together that we mentioned at the start of worship with this Q&A service coming at the end of the month, that we're hoping and we're trusting and we're having faith that God is the one who is driving this work of a basis of union and basis of team ministry. That's what we're trying to discern. So in verses 2 through 6, Paul's reminding all of us about the radical unity that we all have as believers in Jesus. This is part of this mystery, part of what only God can reveal to us. And in verses 9 through 10, Paul gives expression to another aspect of the ministry when he says, and to bring light for everyone. What is the plan of the mystery? Hidden for ages in God who created all things. So the church, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to rulers and authorities and the heavenly places. Now back when I was in university, one of the classes I took I spent was a whole semester slowly and carefully translating Ephesians from the original language. I remember going through the first part of chapter 3 and reading these two verses, verses 9 and 10. And the implica implications are profound. Let's unpack it just for a couple of moments. And it says, to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And here's the part to pay attention to right now. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, through the church, the wisdom of God might be made known to rulers and authorities in, in the heavenly places. Now you pardon me for saying this, but wow. What are these verses actually saying? They're saying that the church, the church is God's chosen vehicle for sharing the good news of salvation. Now when the New Testament speaks about a church, it's using the particular word ecclesia, and it speaks about the church. And do we think in the earliest times of the church, did they have lovely church buildings like we're enjoying today? No. Where did they meet the earliest Christians? Say again? At home, people's houses, right? You ever thought about your house as a church before? <laughs> but ecclesia, this word we translate as church, has nothing to do with buildings. Nothing. Nada, zilch. Instead, ecclesia is better understood as a kind of gathering or assembly. And what's the fundamental ingredient for a gathering or an assembly? People. It's people, right? It's not a trick question. People are needed for a gathering or an assembly. And each of us here is a part of the church. God wants to use each of our lives as an instrument of Christ's salvation for others. Let me say that again. God wants to use each of our lives as the instrument of salvation, of Christ's salvation for others. God wants to use our lives to save other people. There was an 18th century Russian saint named Seraphim of Serov. That's quite a good name, isn't it? And he once wrote, if you acquire a piece of spirit, thousands around you will be saved. If you acquire a piece of spirit, thousands around you will be saved. And of course, peace of spirit only comes from who? From God, from Jesus, yes. So if the Lord Jesus is at work in our lives, then God will use our lives as instruments of salvation for others. And this, I think, is what Paul is saying to us in verses 9 through 10. God will use our lives as instruments of salvation for others. That when the Spirit breaks into our lives with the gift of faith, when we live that faith out, amazing things will happen. And that is when every member of the church becomes a living witness to the gospel in the here and now. And also in these heavenly places that Paul mentions so often in Ephesians. And verses 9 through 10 remind us of another related biblical truth that the church, the people, the believers, we bear witness to God's new creation. 
Friends, there's only one reason that the church exists, and it's to tell other people about Jesus Christ. That's the only reason, the fundamental reason. All of our other ministries, all of our outreach, all of our care, all of our everything comes out of this fundamental truth. The church exists to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. I'll try to remind us of this again when we come to Easter time. The church is part of God's new creation. The church is unlike any other organization, any other club, any other gathering. The church has a specific existence and a specific role. It's part of God's new creation. It's a sign of God's inbreaking kingdom. And this means for us today three short things. One, that the church is central to history. The church is central to history. And again, we're not talking about buildings. We're talking about people. The lives within the church are central to history. So if you're ever tempted to think that your life does not matter, please think again. The fact that each of us are part of the living body of Christ, it reminds us we're all part of something much, much bigger than ourselves. And as members of the church, we're all part of God's greater instrument of salvation for others. Nations will come and go. Kingdoms rise and fall. Philosophies, ideologies will go in and out of style. And through it all, the living church of Jesus, we are told, shall endure. We have the Lord's promise that not even the gates of hell shall prevail against it. The church is central to what's going on in history. Every life within the church matters and has great import. It also means the church is central to the gospel. The church is meant to be a living, breathing reminder of the good news of Jesus. That's our primary call here in Chemney. Each of us is called to be a witness to the new work that God is doing. In our life together as the church, we are meant to be a road sign to the new humanity created in Jesus. So the church is central to history, central to gospel, and the church is central to Christian living as well. Now, over the years, I can't even count how many times someone has said to me, I believe in God. Yeah. I want nothing to do with the church. You never heard this before. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one level, <clears throat> I have to admit this is very understandable. Because there are a lot of people who have been wounded by the church. We might even know some of them, we might even be one of them, right? And we can and we should grieve deeply when people have been hurt by the body of Christ. Perhaps, as I said, some of us here have been hurt ourselves or know someone who has, and these hurts are real, never should be downplayed or dismissed or hidden away. Because on one hand, the church is the bride of Christ, the witness to Jesus, but it's also very full of broken and imperfect people. And yet I still say that the church is central to Christian living. I still can say that. Because this passage from Ephesians, it tells us so, and it reminds us that not being a part of the church is not a viable option for believers. Not being part of the church is not a viable option for believers. This is more about bums in this is this is more than about bums in pews or in chairs. It's not about fulfilling a legal righteousness either, about coming to church. It's about committing to each other as fellow believers in Jesus Christ. It's about committing to worship. It's about committing to staying grounded in the good news of Jesus. We all know that we're living in a very interesting time in the life of the church, aren't we? We have this great gift of modern technology when, on one hand, enables us to more easily share our worship, especially with our brothers and sisters at Littlewood Court. Hi, by the way. And if if it's a necessity for us to join worship online, if that's all that's available to us, 
And we can say, praise God for the ability to do so, truly. It's a gift. Can I be blunt? But if we have the ability, the time, and the energy to come to worship, to come to worship and be with other believers, and we still instead choose to join online, there might be a problem. That's not ideal. There is... There's something sacred about being together as believers. There's something that happens when we gather together as believers. There's a shared experience of worship, a shared experience of the Holy Spirit. And by not being in church when we can be, I think we're depriving ourselves of so many vital aspects of the Christian life. We're robbing ourselves and others of opportunities for fellowship and for mutual spiritual growth. And so I ask you and I entreat you, if you cannot truly come to church, the church is still here for you. Try to join like to do like we do at Littlewood Court and join with others and watch online. Be present with fellow believers and worship. But if you can come, If you can come, please come. Come and be present as part of the body, as part of this joint witness to the mystery of Jesus Christ, as Paul talking about in Ephesians 3. Because Ephesians 3, it reminds us that we're all stewards of the mystery of the gospel. We're all stewards of this mystery that God has revealed to us. This is what it means to be the church, this instrument of God's salvation. So as we go into another week together, may we all remember this calling. And may we all lean into it together, however we can. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue in worship now with singing our next hymn of praise, I the Lord of Sea and Sky.
Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. As we gather in your name to pray for others, Lord, we thank you that you are revealing some of your mystery through your Holy Spirit to us in this day and age. We come before you this morning approaching you with the freedom and confidence knowing that you hear our prayers. We bring to you the countries of Madagascar, Mozambique and Malawi who have recently been hit and may be hit again by Cyclone Freddy from the Indian Ocean. We pray for the people who have had their lives and their homes devastated, damage to their crops, an increase in cholera, and damage to infrastructure. We pray for healing, restoration, and the rebuilding of resilient communities. Father, we give thanks for the beginnings of a new relationship between Saudi Arabia and Iran and the possible knock-on effect this could have in the Middle East, particularly in Yemen, Syria, and Lebanon. We pray that these two countries can begin to work in harmony, and we give thanks for the initiative shown by China in the early agreement. We bring before you too this morning, Lord, the Rohingya people who have lost everything in a fire at Cox's Bazaar. We pray for the organizations who are helping them to find shelter and hope again. We continue to pray for peace in Ukraine and we give thanks for the resilience for them as a community. We pray that the electric grids may be slowly restored and give thanks that as the warmer weather of springtime is coming, that they, and we ask you, Lord, to bless them all in their continuing struggle. We feel overwhelmed, Lord, by global hunger, poverty, and unrest, and at times by our own personal challenges, whatever they may be. Help us not to flee from these challenges, our feelings of being overwhelmed, our uncertainties, but to seek you, knowing that you are beside us, walking with us, your hand on our shoulder, and to put our trust in you. As we work together, Lord, to form a new parish locally, help us to build community in a world of individualism, Help your church to show the beauty and power of the collective and pour your blessings upon our relationships. Father, we are made in your image, the source of love, the living God who is our hope, our truth and love. Amen. And as we join together in the Lord's Prayer, Lord, make us aware that we are praying this for ourselves and for others. Help us to pray this as a Christian community. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and give us our debts as we forgive and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Noel. When I'll sing our closing song of praise, we'll walk the land.
As we go into another week, may we remember that we are the church, every single one of us. May we walk the land here in Kemne and wherever we go, letting our lights shine brighter and brighter. May all that we say, all that we think, and all that we do point others to the good news of Jesus Christ. And may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, may this blessing be upon each of us and upon all who we know this day and forevermore.